Hey, and welcome to another episode of Creative Leaders Unplugged, brought to you by Future Skills Academy. I'm Morgan, here with Arna, and today we talk to Adam Lawrence, uh, yeah, yes. facilitator, aficionado, uh, yes. global service jam. Yeah, global service jam, very important. I, I, it's, it's coming back, folks, it's coming back, so sign up. Um, it's important. It, it, it's been important at the start of the whole service design movement um and um we want it back uh and uh because it is really cool to be part of that movement and that jam and the community and uh, the energy um yeah so anyway i i, I you know adam is is, is a, a sort of a, he's a really a hero of my uh you know someone who yeah yeah someone who's been uh, very inspirational, uh, you know, set an example and kind of a standard in facilitation and being a facilitator. Um, mm -hmm. So, which which really has uh, had a big impact on on me and many other people. Um, so, yeah, so really cool to have him um, on the show. Yeah. yeah, and he's and you know, I know that he'd written the book. Um, this is. I just want to make sure I get the title of the book right. The title of the service book design is "Design Doing." This is service design doing. Yes, and um, of course he had he had written that, and so I anticipated. Yeah, in, in my mind, right? I have an idea of how the conversation might go, and it went a different way, um, which I thought was also really beautiful and refreshing because in the end he talks about the importance of facilitation and kind of where he feels feels the future of things is going. Um, and I think how how he ends with his final conclusion is just beautiful. And I think it's something that a lot of people, whether they're interested in service design or just design in general or just being creative, I think it's really applicable advice um, that we should all really think about, it, especially as we're starting to move into a world where more non-human voices are uh, going to be in the arena as well. Yeah, exactly. So... Um... Yeah, so I, I, I know just uh, yeah. So just go and listen to the conversation, um, and uh, uh, do let us know um, uh, you know what you think. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, I I can I could have talked to Adam for, for many more hours, um, but I'm really happy with uh, with uh, this interview. So yeah, yeah. Hope you guys also enjoy. I grew up in the UK, I've been most of my life in Germany. I am emotionally uh, German, I guess, um, a, a, a pro-European uh, person. Um, my work has taken me, without describing my job now, it's taken me from psychology through theatre and working with large organisations. So it's kind of a mixture of all those things. I'm really into... Um, play at, outside of work so and in work as well sometimes but i do uh, medieval not reenactment but recreation we call it so at the weekend you'll often find me dressed up and hitting my friends with sticks which is really fun <laughs> all over the world um i really enjoy nature i studied zoology and i love being outside and uh, especially enjoy being around animals so that's if that doesn't confuse you morgan I know my brain is shit. <laughs> yeah, like, I, went, I went all the way there, and then I went all the way there, and then mm -hmm. I went all the way to the other side, and we're like, "What?" There's some weird, some, some weird jumps in there, but I didn't. Looking oh. back, I didn't really see them as jumps at the time. I mm -hmm. thought they were, but then looking back on it, I saw the the continuity between these different things. What is the continuity between those things? The continuity between them is humans collaborating to try and make other humans feel a certain way. So that could be in psychology, where it might be a collaboration between a therapist and a therapy, talking and using words and storytelling to make someone feel maybe better or to cope with something. Mm -hmm. um, in I worked in the motorcycle industry, so back there it was about coordinating factories and designers and sales organizations to give somebody a conglomeration of steel and plastic and glass and gasoline, which they would really enjoy uh, riding down the road very fast or which would get them to work reliably in the mornings or some combination of those so they feel happy about the, the freedom that gave them and the possibilities that gave them. And in theatre, it's very, very direct. You have these 
group of people, some of them are, consider themselves artists, some of them are technicians, some of them are business folks, uh, some are looking after those people. Um, but together they put innovation on stage in budget every six to eight weeks. And they've been doing that for two and a half thousand years in, in the West, longer in the East. Yeah, so it's a really, really interesting um, novelty factory, innovation factory, story factory, whatever you want to call these things. All those things are part of that. Might be using old plays, but do them in new ways each time and so on. So that's really, really interesting. And between all of those, there's this idea of human beings working together with human, other human beings and material things to create something which somebody else values. How does zoology fit into the picture? Well, like, <laughs> one of the dolphins made when I was a little girl. Yeah, I did a double. I did a double degree back in the day, just a bachelor uh, of zoology and psychology. So I, I specialized in in monkey thinking. So it's nice mm. to be here today with, <laughs> with you folks. This is brilliant. Yeah, and I, I guess today I'm most known for my work in facilitation, and one of the ways that I seem to be able to engage people and uh, and help them to do good work is by constantly reminding myself we are monkeys here what do monkeys need right now mm. and that, explains that might in, yeah it might include social time it might include uh physical needs it might include seeing seeing things change visual stimulation a break whatever it is food something to climb on you know all these things are important <laughs> Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, but, 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 so my question was sort of if you, um, because now, you know, you, you're looking back and you're, you're seeing all these connections and, and mm. it makes sense sort of, but um, when you were starting out uh, without really, you know, having the benefit of being able to look back, um, w w where did that all come from? I mean, is it, was it something inside your DNA or, 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 I mean, why did you do all these things and other people didn't? I'm not really sure. I mean, I was always, so with the zoology and psychology, I always just loved David Attenborough on television, you know, these sort of like great BBC and Anglia television documentaries about, about animals, you know, and that's what I wanted to be. I wanted to be on TV talking about animals and I, that's really hard job to get. So I, I failed to get that one, but I, I did have the degree then. And psych, and part of that was psychology uh, psychology to marketing is not very long step, you know? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I moved into motorcycles and this was back in the day where marketing was not just promotion. It was all the P's man. It was deciding what product do we make and so on. It's in the eighties still. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I thought the big jump was moving from motorcycle industry into theater. I thought that was a big step at the time. But then some years later, when I started blogging in the mid 2000s, I guess when blogs were big, I was writing about theatricality that I saw in everyday business, you know, in commercial life and obvious stuff, you know, like lighting and costume and so on, but also less obvious stuff like dramatic arcs and timing and role and relative status and story and all this kind of thing. And when I started looking at it through that lens, yeah. Then I started to understand the connections between what I'm doing before. I mean, theater is in bad Greek. It's the seeing place. It's the place where we see things. Yeah. Um, Chekhov, I think, said a play is a, is a whole life in one hour. And, and Oscar, Oscar Wilde said he knows no other way of more genuinely making a human being understand how it is to be another human being than through theater. So I think there's a lot of a lot of truth that gets re gets revealed when you're working in theater. And mm -hmm. that, I think, that lens was the one that let me connect all these things together. And it's still a lens I use in my work almost entirely. Yeah, I, I know there's also, um, and I actually do want to go a little back to, to where, 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 when did you, you know, decided to uh, become German and, and those things. Uh, but uh, I just, uh, because you were talking about the theater, um, there's a you know this whole thing around uh, innovation theater and um, uh, but and 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 I was thinking about that recently um, that actually because um, we were so I'm 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 doing these change agent programs and stuff mm. like that and that that allows you know basically people get appointed to be a change agent and then I started realizing that actually that's a terrible thing to be called sometimes because okay. it's like you are a change agent you're gonna and people go like ooh like you. <laughs> 
that's how I was like, <laughs> oh, <laughs> are you trying to get rid of me? Or, or yeah, what's the catch, right? Um, mm-hmm. Because it's dangerous. And um, so anyway, we were doing these programs, and um, and I, I I kind of do a sort of a leadership program, and part of that is really um, you know getting to you know you have to get to know yourself, your own boundaries, and um, we do you know through origin stories, and uh, and people really need to open up because otherwise you don't understand who you are, what your limitations are or why you respond in a certain way mm. to a group, et cetera, et cetera. So we ask uh, people to really open up and, and be vulnerable because if, you know, if you are not vulnerable as a leader, how can everyone, anyone else be, et cetera, mm. et cetera. So it's kind of logical in a way to think about it, but then people, there's this limit where people are like, oh, wait a minute, I'm not going to be that vulnerable mm. because I don't really, really trust the organization I work for. Mm. Don't really trust it. It's not a real thing. It is acting. It is so there is a business theater going on as well. Yes, you are in a role. And you know, people, you know, in different contexts, people behave differently. So in a way, there is always a bit of theater. Yeah. There. And this is this is kind of the the theater maker inside me is kind of squirming right now. Um, because this is this is the common understanding of theatre, yeah, that it is a pretense, that it's a facade. And people who work in theatre, we reject that. So I understand when I use the word innovation theatre, I mean it in the same way. I mean, you're faking it. yeah. Mm-hmm. But really good theatre is never fake. It's more true than real life. Yeah? Mm. I'd like to make a comparison. My, one of my favourite, I think probably my favourite actor is still Sir Anthony Hopkins. And he's most famous for his role in The Silence of the Lambs. Yeah. And the reason he is so terrifying as Hannibal Lecter is he could have been that. If he just switched off a couple of his own moral safety fuses, yeah, he has the capacity to be that because we all do. We, when, when, when a good actor, they reveal sides of themselves they don't normally show. Willem Dafoe says the same thing. I'm, I'm, I'm a cabinet and I open different drawers each time and show you what's in there, but they're all drawers within me, the ones I normally keep closed. And that's terrifying. Like mid-century Godzilla movies with a human being in a rubber suit, yeah? He's knocking over Tokyo, but it's not scary because it's not real, yeah? It's obviously a person in a rubber suit. And even the CGI ones you see today, amazing as they are, they're not scary in that way. What's scary is is Hannibal Lecter, which is Sir Anthony Hopkins, showing another side of himself. So when we talk about theatre, we see it as the seeing place, I said it before, as a an arena in which we can show truth yeah. So, and not, not to pretend to be something else. Yeah. But I think we're talking about the same thing. So when you talk about innovation theater, that's, mm-hmm. I, I get that. That's sort of yeah, like, that's, you, the, you facade, know, that's, that's, a, that's the facade. facade. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But the, but when I mean, I mean, what I mean with this business theater is that it's real. You're there, mm-hmm. you're the real mm-hmm. person, but you don't show that side of yourself. Yeah, exactly. You decide that which side to show. Yeah. Right, because you're like, that's not where I'm going. I'm showing this part of me because mm. this belongs, because this is how I survive. This is how my brain tells me I'm going to survive in this context, in this system. Yeah. I have to behave in this certain way. And there's, and, and then I come in or someone else comes in and says, well, if you really, really want to kind of um, change, you have to open up that little door too. And people yeah. go like, no, I'm not going to open exactly. that door because that's dangerous because I don't really, really trust. So, because... I, to me, uh, you know, play and theater and, and acting, I, 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 I think that's part of human nature. I don't know if every, anybody or every, everyone realizes that or, or feels it in the same way, but you always play a certain part in the, within the certain yeah. context. Yeah. It doesn't mean it's fake. That's but it. To your that's, point, it. That, that, that's the difference, yeah? It's the difference between the, what I'm choosing to show and when I pretend to be a thing that I'm not, yeah? And most of us, we go into business context for example and we have some of those drawers of the cabinet open and we keep some of them are closed because they're for our private lives or even our secret lives that we might have yeah um and that's fine somebody can i think choose a part of themselves to show or to not show and still be genuine i think there are benefits to exploring other things that we could open which are not normally open to be more vulnerable and so on that was not in go back 30, 40 years and say someone should be vulnerable in the office. That was just ridiculous. Yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, mad exactly. men and all the rest of it in the 80s, you know, all this kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, at the same time, if I, if I uh, pretend I have a drawer open, which is not really part of me, people smell that. People really, really smell inauthenticity in very, very exactly. quickly. 
But what I can do maybe is I can I can stretch towards things. I can learn to do things. And what you're talking about here, that that feeling of hesitancy to to show more of myself, to be to be more of a whole person, which would be I think really ideal if we could be our whole selves all the time. Um, we in theatre really obsess about that, and we call that the concept of safe space. And the safe space is a situation in which it's okay for me to be myself and it's okay for me to fail. And in fact, failure is ex an expected part of the process. And that's really the opposite of the situation in most organizations, that failure is expected to be part of the process and is seen as valuable. And we do that in theater by having physical surroundings in which we do rehearsals, which are different from the rest of the theater. And they, they, they bring up our whole mindset in us of failure. You know, it's these rehearsal rooms, these uh, black curtains and black painted floorboards and terrible coffee and stuff like this. And in those, we're happy to do things that we wouldn't do otherwise, to scream and fall over and take our clothes off and stuff. And we decide what leaves that. Yeah? And that's not a situation that you have in most organizations. Definitely not. And I'm really curious because you said that you're emotionally German and to have this um, like this safe space. And it, I can hear you talk about so many of the parallels, of course, between organizations and, and working in these spaces and, and opening up true parts of ourselves. But was was theater something like that you were immediately drawn to or did it like, have you always been interested in this aspect of of tapping into different versions? Because, of course, I don't know what it means to be German or emotionally German. I have a slight vague idea in my head. But when I think of the German stereotypes, of course, I think of a country that waits to cross the road unless the mm. light is green, even if there's no cars at all. <laughs> I'm not very good at that one yet. I'm working on that one still. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So how did, did, was that something that was also encouraged in your uh, like upbringing? Like, okay, yeah, just experiment and play around and you have the safe space to, to dress up and hit your friends with sticks or was this something that you came to love? And uh... I think, I think it was, um, I did the usual school theater type stuff, you know, that everybody think does. And I was okay at it. Um, but my family, um, my parents would always, uh, be organizing, you know, costume parties and stuff like that and events in the village and things, you know, so there was that kind of playfulness to getting together, which I thought was really interesting. Um, I got, I'm showing really my, I'm showing my, my nerd colors here. You know, I, I used to do tabletop role playing games, Dungeons and Dragons type things, you know, and that's what got me into the medieval stuff actually was doing that first, but it's, it's, it's that playing together and saying, we're going to play together without a board. Yeah, we're going to play together without lines on the floor, which tell us where the game's over. And I think that's been a thread through my life. You know, that 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 we, that the people who are playing the game, we hold the space, and we decide where the space ends, rather than having that imposed by the monopoly board or the tennis court or whatever it was. I always found those kind of games much less interesting uh, than the ones which are developed and, um, if you like, evolved while they're being played by the players. And whether that's a harvest breakfast on the village green and let's see what happens, we'll put we'll put on funny hats and see what happens, you know, that kind of thing, up to these massive sort of medieval things I take play I take part in now. There's all that that is that idea of a sort of a blurring edge to it. And that's quite interesting too, because generally when people define something like a game, they say it has a boundary. Yeah. yeah. You know, the foot the football works because there's a line around the field and that that's Monopoly works because you don't just take five dice at once. You always have the, the fixed number of dice and things like this. Mm -hmm. So maybe that's a link uh, between these things. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, and I'm, and I'm thinking, cause I also, I studied play a bit and games are not always play. No. I, in the way that I think about play and I think about games, but of course there can be some games that are play, but they're mm. not always mutually exclusive. And, um, yeah. So what you're saying about boundaries is then also, yeah. When we can start games, push sorry, my, 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 my brain went, what? Well, games are not always play. Yeah, explain. <laughs> <laughs> well, in the, in the, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, the way that I learned about play is that you're just doing something just to do it, not for a desired outcome or goal. So if you play a tennis match and say, I'm playing this tennis match to win, you're actively moving your body and yes, you're playing tennis, but you're not necessarily playing because you're so fixed on winning the game. Which is especially true when it becomes professionals, for example, 
doing this yeah. as their job and for money and so on. I think I think it's it's a it's a it's a it's not a not a clear definition or demarcation between those things because yeah. you there are lots of things going on at this. I'm if I'm playing a board game with my family. I'm still kind of trying to win, but the absolute the other object is to have fun together and and mm -hmm. to and to spend time uh, together and laugh and stuff like this. So I think there's lots of things going on at different levels, and it's a thing to talk about a lot. Which a very interesting thing here is, I have the word play in in my company. We're called Work Play Experience, yeah, um, but I don't use the word very much at work, although I'm doing often quite playful things and I'm having rubber chicken in my pocket nearly all the time and stuff like this. Um, that's not what I lead with. Uh, we lead with, I've, I learned this from Arna actually in our book, he talks about, you know, doing the first meetings maybe with a suit on and then the tie comes off and then the jacket comes off and then you get more and more right. sort of relaxed with people and very much in the same way. When I work with organizations, I'm wearing a suit nearly all the time and, we talk, we talk science and so on before we do things which somebody else might see as playful. We often don't call them even play or a game. We might say, let's do some brain training. Yeah. Or mm -hmm. let's make a simulation. You know, well, yeah, use these words. You, you, you were the one um, saying, you know, um, don't say role play, but yeah, show, do don't tell. Yeah. Yeah. I don't right. like the word role play. Um also because I know more than one person who has written in their employment contract. This is not a joke. They have written in their employment contract. They will not be required to do role play <laughs> because they've been so hurt and by it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I use theatrical rehearsal methods mm -hmm. in my work nearly all the time, but I don't use that word role. play. I'm not asking you to play a role. I'm asking you to simulate a situation. Try this, you know, yeah, I tried that and iterate. One. So I, I, you know, I and iterate exactly. Yeah, I know because uh, I, I think I've, I've been. I mean, we've met many times, and I, I kind of, kind of remember when it was exactly. But I do remember this with the chicken and the iteration, and just do, do you know, do it over and over and over again. Exactly. You know, so like uh, you were stopping people when they, you know, halfway when they were showing and not telling, and they, you were like, no, wait, wait, go back and do it again. Yes, so it feels like you're rehearsing for a theater for a yeah. play. Yeah. You know, and, 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 and so until it fits, until it feels natural, until it feels like, yeah, this is how, you know, mm -hmm. we want to enter there. No, that's weird. And then the chicken is either the chicken is a doorbell. The chicken is a phone. The chicken is, exactly. I don't know. So exactly. you got really, the chicken got really famous as well, by the way. So. Yes, it has. I've sort of, uh, <laughs> the first chicken I ever had, I was, this is weird. I was at a medieval event in the middle of the forest and two cars drove up with, with a bunch of American soldiers in them. And they got out and they gave me a chicken, a rubber chicken and some gaffer tape or duct tape, as you call it, and drove away again. There's a kind of a story behind that, but, uh, that, that was a very <laughs> surreal moment. And, uh, <sighs> there are lots of reasons I have chickens, rubber, rubber chickens around me all the time. Um, perhaps the, the, let's say the the logical one is that the model of mindset which i like from my very very ancient psychology degree is that mindsets are sets literally sets of stimulus response pairs yeah so mm -hmm. i if a certain thing happens i will respond this way to it nearly all the time in that mindset if i have a different mindset then i respond to it differently so um, I might have a, a professional mindset or a family mindset and you know, things like this. And I respond to different things, different ways. And it seems, uh, that those mindsets are very strongly triggered by the physical context that I'm in. Yeah. So if the three of us are standing wearing our fancy, you know, fancy suits and, and, and our killer shoes standing around a big mahogany table in the boardroom, you know, with a view out over Manhattan or something, and uh, and Morgan says to me, Adam, that wasn't the best idea I've heard this year. You know, that's that's fighting talk. You know, that's going to be that that's that's an offer of conflict. Yeah, but the same people could be down at some bar after there with uh, with the a different kind of mahogany table now. You know, one that's got beer mats on it and and maybe a, a few pumps and they've got some glasses in front of them and they've loosened off their ties. And now Morgan can say, Adam, you're an idiot today, and we'll laugh about it. Yeah, the same people in the same, in a different context. So I think it's really, really funny when that board, or really, really interesting when that big boardroom table has a rubber chicken on it. Yeah. <laughs> because what's the appropriate mindset now? Yeah. What's the, what, what, what is the appropriate mindset when there's 
yeah, let's say a rubber chicken on on the boardroom table, or maybe there's a maybe there's a um, some kind of scientific device in the nightclub. Yeah, what, what does this do? It's very very interesting stuff. Mm. Yeah, because you're 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 basically messing with people's brains basically yeah. because your brain is trying to figure out what the game is and what the rules are and how to act within that you know within that context very nice to, you yeah. know and then when you go like here's the robot and the, the brain goes like oh not then, you know, yeah. <laughs> i don't very know nice. this game. i don't understand <laughs> how to survive this situation yeah so yeah and then and that means that they um you know it can also mean that because well here's the thing so you are also someone who um is um you know people will allow you to do that mm. as well and not i mean i don't think everyone who brings that rubber chicken will have the same fact that there's also mm. this because you are very comfortable with doing that and uh, and i remembered uh, um doing it because so I, I i actually when i started out with, you know in, in service design and 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 and, and facilitation specifically mm. uh, which mm. i kind of i didn't didn't really know what that was i just kind of it happened i was like oh what what am i doing what is this i'm uh i'm slightly autistic i i I'm, I'm not i'm i i don't really like groups of people mm. <laughs> but i do all the time but still i don't really like and i'm not someone who plays i like to kind of uh you know uh play games in the groups and stuff like that that's not really who i am mm -hmm. so but i remember really well we did a game somewhere in london i we had this totally is it's supposed to be a party i don't know i don't know misfired or something something went wrong but we had a group of people in a park in london and you did it you did this whatever we're in a circle and we were doing this game of of, of, of passing a, 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 a an invisible ball or something mm. anyway that you were doing, like me yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah well it was sort of and i i, I realized remember, yeah. yeah but and i realized that um what the strength was of you um, or any really good facilitator so in this this case you, you I, I realized what your strength was and is is that i wanted to do it right for you mm -hmm. i didn't i was going to participate because i felt that you um you just asked us to, to do stuff and we were going to do it <laughs> there's no way i was going to not do it it was like because it was like i need to because adam is like you're you're the it's about presence. It's about this totally mm. comfortable. It's like, of course, we're going to do this it's logical. And like, there's no getting away from it. So, <laughs> so then you get into it and then, you know, you know that when you, you know, get into it and then it becomes fun and you become com comfortable because everyone's into it. And so this idea of creating that space, because that's what you do. You create this space where it's actually kind of uncomfortable, really, because you're like, what's going to happen? How, mm. how silly is this going to be? Uh, you know, is that, is this something I want? Is everyone going to do it? And then all of a sudden it's there and you're like, oh, this is fun. It's an amazing switch. So there's rubber chicken, uh, chicken on the tail. You know, if you have it, um, it's also about having a presence that you are able to do this instead of really freaking people out or that they're going to freeze or, you know, or flee or whatever response they have to a dangerous situation. Thank you. I'm going to be humble in here and say not everyone likes to do it, and that's fine, you know. And and um, one of my uh, favorite um, inspirations is a game designer called Tiagi, and uh, he points out that uh, there are there are two. What is it? Some people learn by making fools of themselves. Others learn by watching others make fools of themselves, and both of those are legitimate. And if I often put that up on on the on a screen before i do this kind of stuff so if somebody wants to just hang out and and not do these kind of things that's absolutely fine there's more than one way to contribute to it you know um but yeah i mean what i've learned since i've been doing this especially through working with the amazing people of the applied improvisation network um is that i've learned that what i was kind of doing subconsciously in those situations is playing with a thing called relative status which is playing with your power behavior that you exhibit you know whether you when when do you seem to be more powerful or less powerful and how you can use both of those to lead you can use low power to lead a group yeah you can use high power to lead a group you can match the power level of the group to get their sympathy or you can contrast the power behavior to surprise them and get them to do things they wouldn't otherwise do so 
since doing that, I've kind of figured out much more about how it's actually working, which makes it much more difficult, of course, because it's like if you've never been taught, you know, if, if you ride a bike, you can ride a bike. If someone explains to you what you're doing when you're riding the bike, you fall off. Oh, my God, that's such a uh, yeah, that is such an important thing to realize that, you know, I actually I saw I did some theater and I uh, some comedy and I, I um. Uh, and we were uh, in the finals of this big thing competition here in the Netherlands, the Lights Cabaret Festival, and um, it's a big thing. And uh, because we were in the finals, um, we got a weekend with a professional teaching us about comedy on stage. Oh, and boy. actually, <laughs> and we, I didn't know anything because it was just spontaneous thing I did with a friend. So I, we had a duo act, and uh, I have no clue. But the finals would be on this big stage in this, you know, beautiful theater in Leiden, and um, and uh, and so we, so he taught us the rule, basically the rules, and and we showed him our act, and he was like, "What that makes no sense," and because my <laughs> role was I do so all I did was I didn't know anything, and I didn't want to be there. And this friend of mine, he really wanted to be famous, and he was really, and I hated him actually, really, and I was like, "Jesus, why am I here?" <laughs> that was my act, and he said. So he was teaching us about, you know, but you have to use the whole stage and you have to all do the blah, blah, blah. And it failed miserably because mm. we were like, and all of a sudden, because the whole thing was genuine in the sense mm. that I really didn't know what I was doing. And all of a sudden, yeah. yeah. Mm. And and so teaching us how to do it properly. It's like, yeah. And that's very much true when, when I'm teaching people around facilitation. Um, sometimes you get very good natural facilitators and you think do i touch this you know is it is it better just to leave it yeah. um what i try and do is give them like alternative tools rather than changing what they're doing but say this is an option this is an option think about this and then they need to play with that they when they first try, try to use that you know it's like uh, years and years ago um L louis armstrong the the uh the, the trumpet player he his embouchement his, his the shape of his mouth on the trumpet uh, was wrong apparently, and he had to. Which was he was always bleeding from the mouth. He's very famously always carried a white handkerchief with him because he's actually dabbing his mouth to soak up the blood while he's playing all the time. Uh, oh. And he had to relearn his embouchement. He had to relearn the shape of his mouth on the trumpet. This is a, a, a he's already a world class trumpet player, yeah, and that set him back, you know, hugely. He had to sort of almost not do gigs and so on for a long time or do very small gigs and so on and, and, and relearn this. And once he'd got that, he could go further, of course. Mm, mm -hmm. But that process is, is a very, very courageous one to do. I'm not, I'm not good at this myself. I'm good at saying, okay, I can do this. Now don't touch it. You know, I'm, I'm an actor and I also sing on stage. I do musicals. I've had no singing lessons in my life and I'm quite scared of getting them because maybe I mess it up. Maybe it's like that, that airplane. Don't ask how it flies. Yeah. It's just, <laughs> yeah, exactly. it's just magic. Exactly. Yeah. I think so too. Yeah. That's the, the, but folks that. do come to me and ask me for help. And I say, okay, here are some things. Here are some things with my colleagues. Of course, we yeah. show them stuff that they can do. And then we say, do please do be aware that when you do this the first few times, you're going to feel weird. Yeah. And I'm thinking of like little kids almost that are learning how to do something, right? Like they're learning how sure. to help in the kitchen or something. And yeah, if you explain the whole process behind what they're doing, of course it's going to be, yeah, throw yeah. them a whole. And this, whole... this, I mean, you talked about change management in your background before as well. I know Aaron is <laughs> very, very accomplished in this. But when organizations start doing things a new way, <laughs> it's going to be worse at first. Mm. Yeah, yeah. It's it's just it's kind of a no brainer, and yet people expect you know give us give us half a day training or or do a quick hackathon, and we've suddenly solved everything. Um, no, this is a new way of behavior and it's yeah. going to feel weird and, and don't it's let funny. go of your old stuff yet. You still need both, you know, but here's, here's yeah. a direction you can grow in. It's funny. It's, it's now I'm thinking about the airplane. That's actually, it's, you know, it's just, we just, because we think it can fly, it, can, it flies. It's like the company, you know, don't touch it. Don't think about it because it's working. Yeah. <laughs> don't, you know, don't, don't, don't think about it too much. Don't look at it. Don't look at it. You know, don't examine it because the whole thing will fall apart. And, uh, yeah. and, uh, and, and it is actually my, uh, ex experience that, uh, and I, I just wrote this article about this, but about how I had all these odd jobs, uh, when I was stud or tended to be a student and, uh, and, and doing all these, uh, these odd jobs, uh, wanted to be a musician and, uh, being a theater and an artist and what have you. And, 
uh, nothing worked out, but anyway, uh, but, but I'm doing all these odd jobs. I always, you know, you know, after a few weeks, I thought, how is this company even, you know, uh, making money? Because it's such a mess. It is so mess and no one talks to each other. You know, it actually is so dysfunctional. It is so terribly dysfunctional. I learned the most from those odd jobs really to, you know, on the factory floor and, you know, working with people who were just nobody ever listened to <laughs> and they knew that. And, uh, and, you know, I didn't, didn't trust the, the you know, uh, the, the people upstairs, et cetera, et cetera. That, I think that's sort of the, um, uh, but that is sort of, you know, in a way, you know, being a bit, maybe a bit cynical in that sense, that's what companies are and they survive because all the others mm. are the same. They're also just dysfunctional. So mm. we work, that's basically why we, we make the a living. More, the more I have the curtain pulled back sometimes, the more I am absolutely amazed because in my mind, I have this idea of like, okay, to run a successful company or run a successful business, right? Like it has to operate one way, right? That's logical. That's how it is in the textbooks. And then I see these examples. I'm like, my gosh, I could be doing this. I mean, not really, but you know, it's not as uh <laughs> yeah. yeah, but it's people working together. It's people, emotional yeah. beings. Uh, it's the monkeys, you know. Um, I, I, th I think I, I, so. There's also beauty, beauty in it. It's just that we we are taught that, or we think, you know, when you when you start out, we have these you you know these amazing smart people. They design these kind of organizations and they're you know make millions of dollars and blah 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 and it's great and you go into a company you're like oh my god it's a total emotional mess right people are scared people are angry people are you know irritated and some people also, and they have fun too by the way they have fun it's great it's all that it's all of these emotions uh, you know and then and they pretend to be a business because they use the same logo you know but it's just a bunch of people it's a community of people working together trying to kind of do something and make a living um, and it's so interesting in a way, if you, as a zoologist, I guess, <laughs> but if you look at, no, but seriously, I mean, if yeah, you look at true. it from that angle, right, you go like that, it's like, you know, if you look at chimpanzees working mm -hmm. together and, and doing stuff weird, aren't we exactly, isn't just that the same thing? That There's an awful lot in common. Yeah. And, and I've been lucky enough to be at the top level of some organization, be witnessed at the top level of some organizations, quite big organizations and seen real, you know, primeval chest thumping displays uh yes. in the boardroom you know where no one even asked what the facts were it was just this opinion against that opinion and people yeah. s threatening to storm out and leaving and packing their stuff and you know and you think really this is more like a soap opera than a than a huge organization and this is how decisions are being made and i think also it's important there's another learning of zoology sometimes you can get it right by accident hmm. yeah and then and then you get we have the, the the human phrase superstition about you know not walking under ladders and so on, but animals also have superstitions. They have behaviours which they believe are effective because they were lucky once, and then they keep doing those things. Yeah. And I think organisations do that as well. It's kind of the rain dance metaphor, you know, that we we do this thing and that makes it rain. If it wasn't rain, we did the, we did the bar they did the dance badly. Yeah, not yeah, because yeah, 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 it's yeah, the wrong exactly. thing to do, but because we messed it up this time. <laughs> and you get these sort of self propagating behaviours in organisations which are. Very, very interesting. And then you look at a similar organization who does it utterly differently and has a similar success. And you think, well, maybe, maybe there's more going on here. Mm. That's the, uh, that's the, there's a, a book called Fooled by Randomness. Yeah. Uh, right. Mm. And, and, um, um, and I think that's, that's it, right? So you kind of, uh, in, there's in, the, in, um, so also in the book there, it's, you know, they, they, it, it describes, you know, someone who, uh, um, uh, deals in the stock market, for instance, and they're and, and you know and they're really successful. Or they're millionaires, and, and they think they they think they they know the trick. Yeah. They think they're they have it, and then they lose everything because actually it's just random. Um, and it's this idea of if you play Russian roulette with a million people, you know, mm. uh, you know, after a long, long time, someone will still be alive, yeah. and that person starts to think, you know, yes. Yes. you know they. They are, it's, it's, they're, you know, what they're doing is the reason they're still alive and it's not randomness and they have some kind of godly kind of uh, whatever power um, and they will live forever and, uh, and they won't because it's random. And it's, it's this really fascinating thing, exactly what you're saying that, that is, it's, it's, yeah. it's human nature. So I'm not saying it's a bad thing. I'm not, I'm, I'm not saying, I, I think it's, it's a, it's, I think it's really interesting. It's just that how can you, 
one thing we just don't do, and I think this is what you know facilitators on a small or a large scale can do, or you know, you step back mm. and you observe and you go like, huh. That's interesting, you know. That's I'm. I'm. This is inter- It's not like oh my god. No, it's like really fascinating. It's interesting. What's happening here? Mm. Why? Why is that? You know, why is that person storming out? And in, interesting energy, the dynamics. But you'll be able to kind of observe that. And I think teaching people to be able to observe and and kind of go on this, you know, the out zoom out and go like, huh, you know, that's I, really, I, right. That's really critical to our practice and. Two things here. That is literally how we teach people to facilitate. We we have a cycle I developed with my colleague Renata Sergnerad and Anna Kira Bex, um, where we a thing happens, and the first thing we do is we try to say say what happened, not on on a non interpretive level. Yeah. So so we don't say um, that person got angry. We say no no no. What did you see in here? That person raised their voice. Okay. Yeah, that that's observable that they raise their voice. Angry is an interpretation. Yeah, and then we say, what else is like that? What else have you seen? Uh, and, and what can we do with this knowledge? So it's always an observe, a connect, if you like, and then a, then a what to do next. Then we try something. It's like a design cycle, you know, or a scientific cycle. You have observations. They give you they give you data, and the data gives you hypotheses, and the hypotheses give you next the next design that you could try. Um, and so that observation of what's going on is absolutely critical to to facilitators. And the other thing is, there's no such thing as a silver bullet in facilitation, but this is the closest one there is to one, is simply stop and tell people what you're seeing. That is incredibly powerful. Whatever's happening, just say, okay, and, and do it in a, non, um, a non-judging, a non-evaluative way. Yeah? I'm noticing that this table have now... Uh, filled out 15 templates this table has done 12 this one has done two just mentioning that yeah or that most teams are now on their third template and this template team's on their 24th just to mention that to people and then that trust them to figure out what to do with that when i hear words like that it reminds me of hearing things like this and just leave it like this. I mean, it's nonviolent communication techniques, basically. But it's incredibly, incredibly powerful just to state what you are seeing. And state in those terms, what I seem to see here, yeah? Not you're doing this and you're doing this, but what I see here is a situation where this is happening. And that's very powerful. And when you, and I'm thinking of facilitation, of course, this is something that I work with a lot in my job. We all, we all do. When you go into facilitation, how much of it would you say is improv and how much of it is directive? Because a lot of times they'll say, hey, Morgan, come and facilitate this. The objective by the end of the day is this. Mm. But it's not ever it's not ever a straight mm. line. Mm. And yeah, it's, ne- it's very rarely a straight line. And often that objective will change. Um, so one of the first things I do when I go into a room is to find out what the people in the room want to get out of the day. And if it's different from what the sponsor said, then okay, well, I'm have a break. I'm gonna make a phone call. Yeah, uh, if, if there's a disconnect between what the room needs to do or wants to do and what the sponsor wants to do, that's a very important thing to establish straight away and decide with all those parties how you're going to handle that. Um, yeah, I think there's again, this is a lot like design, isn't it? You have you have um, some kind of direction you want to head in which might be around a certain result or a certain quality of what you're trying to achieve. Yeah. But you don't know what shape it's going to be until you get there. And, and often that's how the way facilitation works as well. You, I, I often have a, a, a plan for what's going to happen that day. Sometimes I have none at all. Literally. I just go in and say, okay, what's, what's, what's the story. Um, but then you have to try stuff. I come from theater, so I do use surprise quite a lot. And I use I use speed quite a lot. In that case, it's helpful to have a plan, at least at the beginning, to sort of get people rolling into this. I want to talk about, you know, figure, I'm, figure, I'm going to do this game anyway. And one of the reasons that, that we did that was went into it quite fast, but I've got time to think about it. That's classic action movie stuff, you know, uh, where you start with an action scene, like every James Bond film starts with an action scene, which has not, nothing to do with the story. It's just to get you engaged. Um, and you can use that, but at some point you have to say, you have to be checking, is this useful? Is this meaningful to the people? And if it's not, then it's, then it's just flash and thunder. It's not, it's, it's, it's pointless. Um, but if it's got them to a place where they can now think in a different way or do things in a, in a productive way, then it's great. And then, yeah, you're, 
I think it was Eisenhower who said, you know, plans are nothing. Planning is everything. So it's, you've, you've had the plan or the experience of what you want to do here. And then you're very, very lightly letting go of it and doing something else. Yeah. Which is why, which is why yeah. it's very hard to work with things like massive pre-prepared Miro boards and things sometimes because then we, yes. Yes. And we don't need that now. We need something else. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. 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 The, the, because, yeah, exactly. Because one of the things uh, uh, that you don't want to do is, uh, you know, it, because if you have all your kind of methods and your tools mm. kind of visible and people are like, oh, we're going through the whole thing. And you're like, mm. oh, I want to skip this one. Mm. Uh, but it's already there. Because so when I uh, when I facilitate sessions, I, you know, I, in this, you, when people are working on a specific canvas, a specific tool, um, uh, they're not, they don't, they don't see the other tool yet. But I do like to kind of start preparing it while they're working on, you know, the previous thing. They go like, oh, they're, they're already, you know, there's a next step. They know it's there and they're preparing it already. Okay. They're putting up this thing and it's like, yeah, you know, we, something's going to happen after this. So be really conscious of sort of, um, you know, because it's all language is all kind of, you're, you know, you're showing people um, what, it, you know, you're putting them in a certain sort of context, sort of mood, sort of uh, environment where they, they are you as a facilitator, you know, what's coming next. And so they don't have to worry about it because mm. you're preparing it is fine. You know, mm. you're, you, so they don't, they can focus on whatever, what's in front of them and not having to worry about next because you're, you're okay. You, you know, you have it all covered. And to give um, them enough uh, structure that they can orient themselves. We talk a lot about freedom within structure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what are the structures that I set up so that people do feel safe space? Yeah. It is easier to play football because of that white lines around the field. Uh, the, the old medieval forms of football that were across the countryside and thousands of people fighting for a ball. People got killed playing that. You know, people got not literally very killed. It's not, not a very safe, safe. space. <laughs> you, put a, you put a white line around the field and people can achieve amazing athletic stuff, yeah, because they have that, yeah. that stop and start and 90 minutes it's over and all these kind of things. Yeah, yeah um, exactly. Sometimes, though, that you... So one of the things that I ethically worry about is when I do trick people with my agendas, yeah, because mm -hmm. I will I will put something on the agenda which seems relatively harmless, and then do something which, yeah, it is what I wrote there, but it's not what you expected. The, the mm -hmm. best example is not even one of my facilitations; it was clients of mine. Uh, I helped out with this one, and they had all their top management together, a hundred, so ten CEOs, ten CFOs, ten CMOs from the, so the whole sort of global organization there and one point on the agenda was like customer insights so what did they expect they expected more powerpoint they expected more more numbers you know maybe a couple of videos something like this but no what happened was the door opened and 48 customers walked in and sat down yeah. <laughs> that's brilliant that yeah. Yeah. it's yeah. absolutely brilliant and those those top management first they were shocked you know they handled it really well we had instructions to how to do a good interview and stuff like this they interviewed them to learn stuff about what they were thinking and for them that was the highlight of the day of course yeah um, but also if you put that on the agenda, meet the customer, uh, yeah, I got a phone call. Um, yeah, I'll, I'm, I'll be dropping out for a moment. You know, you need to sometimes trick people to get them to a place they need to be, but is that ethical? Is another question. Yeah. Good question. <laughs> I don't know. I've done the, I've done these things. I did so much. It's fun. So I, yeah, I it's very fun. Yeah. <laughs> I'm in favor of tricking them to get them where they need to be. You know, yeah. Yeah, sure. you weren't Would hired, you? you weren't hired or called upon in that moment to say, yeah, give me a day that I expect. Mm. And, you know, like you're brought in for a reason, right? You are, you can do something that they cannot do on their own. And sometimes that means, you know, letting them think it's just going to be another PowerPoint and not by lying and saying, yeah, we're going to sit through another slide deck. But uh, yeah, well, this is where we get into the uh, trust the process thing, right? We, uh, oh, I, hate that's right. Yeah, 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 I know it's a horrible, <laughs> but 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 it is sort of this idea of what you really want people to not judge things before they do it, yeah, and yeah. judge it after they do it. So, this is what I yeah. typically tell people like, you know, just go and do it, you know, uh, judge it after, not before, because uh, you otherwise you'll never know. Mm -hmm. So, you know, try it out and then hate it, that's fine, uh, yeah. but usually. When they go through it, you know, they're like, oh, and then it starts making sense. And it might, you know, take a while, and sometimes even after the, the whatever session. 
Um, but it's it's so you are always manipulating people in a way because they you're the one telling them you know where to go and what to do and what to experience. Um, but it, but it's so it's also experience of the facilitator. And this is why when you start out facilitating, uh, you don't, haven't experienced that. You only you don't only see people going like what? No, mm -hmm. I'm not going to do that. Mm -hmm. No. Um, and so, but once you know, like no, but wait later you know, the penny will drop. You're like, ah, now it makes sense. And 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 so I think that's also part of uh, being a facilitator. Again, you know what's going to happen. And because you know you're comfortable with that, but you also know that they're going through this rough time. So, you know, they they will go through... Uh, I usually use a, sort of a storytelling um, narrative for the design in the sense that I'm not, I don't always talk about it to the participants, but uh, it's the... I was very inspired by... Um, uh, Kurt Vonnegut's uh, little video, which is mm. went viral, and but he talks about man in hole. Yeah. So to me, it's like you know, <laughs> everything's fine. It's okay. It starts out nice. It's good, and then you know you you know you would fall down a hole, and, uh, and then you climb out again, and then. It's like, but you have a sort of um, another kind of you because um, I remember at one time that became quite a thing as well, uh, a sort of a, a, a visualization of how the the sort of the energy or the pattern yeah, of the, the yeah what what do the, the the dramatic arcs we call them which is actually not what they are so what you describe from Vonnegut or something like the hero's journey is a dramatic arc which tracks mm -hmm. the fortunes of somebody yeah that's what yeah. He, he, Macbeth aims too high and crashes down you know so he yeah. goes up becomes Thane of Cormus Cordor of Glamis of becomes king and then crashes down to becoming nothing that's a true dramatic arc but there's another word which in in German is Spannungsbogen or in I guess it's very similar in Dutch um yeah, in, in French is corbe de tension, the curve of tension. And that shows the rhythm of engagement during uh, an experience. Uh, so now now I'm really, really focused. Now I'm kind of relaxed. You know, I'm thrilled or I'm chill. Both of those are good. Thrill is good. Chill is good. And there are patterns that that feel right. This goes back to Aristotle, Freitag, people like this. But Aristotle two and a half thousand years ago writing about this and saying it's not the elements of a play that really matter. It's the, the sequence that they come in and, and the, the 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 rhythm of thrill and chill, thrill and chill. And some of these rhythms work and some of them don't. So the one I, I talked about is called boom, wow, 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 boom. Yeah, or things like this. Or actually it's boom, wow, 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 boom. Ah. Yeah, these are little story structures in terms of the tension, and they kind of overlay, if you like, the yeah. the fortunes of the character in the story, which is what Vonnegut yeah. was talking about. Yeah, yeah exactly. um, and it's really interesting because if you can you can like listen to music and you can hear this, you know, you can hear this is this is up, this is down, this is up, this is down. You can you can watch any kind of movie and see it in there. You can see it in the structure of TV series. You can see it in religious services, all kind of things. You see the same structures coming back again and again. And if we're talking about experiences being satisfying, part of that, of course, is the transactional thing. Yeah, I got my chewing gum that I wanted to buy. But also, if I want to make this special, what was the emotional journey that I went through doing that in terms of tension and relaxation, thrill yeah. and chill? It's a rhythm that, uh, and I, 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 I really, and you know, you're you're a musician, and uh, and I and I, which is such a magical thing, right? So you. You, you, there's these kind of I, I'm, I'm a singer i stand near musicians <laughs> <laughs> are our singers not musicians <laughs> i don't consider myself <laughs> no, one, no, but Sorry, oh my God. there certainly are some who are but i'm not one <laughs> okay <laughs> but well thank you. i make music i make music well th that makes you and then you're a musician yes. then you're a musician but <laughs> uh but a, a humble one okay uh however uh, uh it's, no but sound and and specifically music is a magical thing because it's it's this invisible mm. you know vibration that somehow in your brain kind of is translated into set of some, some sounds or yeah something. that it makes a it makes you feel something and uh, but I think there's there's also something about rhythm itself so uh, and I, I, I'm you know this is way too 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 complicated and scientific for me but i was reading uh, an article about how everything really is rhythm in nature and mm. you know in our cell structures in our everything 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 is actually rhythm and um and so we are very sensitive to rhythm mm. uh, and patterns and uh, you know yeah. we are pattern uh, uh, recognizers mm. we, but mm. but it's but it has to do with these rhythms and it's in everything, all, all our building blocks are basically uh, they're rhythm. 
And so I think there's there's some some essence to that 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 we recognize patterns and rhythms. I think we certainly do, and you can see how there are these wonderful sort of um, things on on the internet where they they recut or they take the trailer of some movie and put different music underneath it and suddenly it's a totally different movie you yeah, know there was exactly. the yes. there's the benny hillifier where you can put the, yeah. the yakety sax music under any <laughs> video and it becomes automatically hilarious or there's that one they had a uh, count doku riding his rocket sled across whatever planet it was and you could put you could put epic music under there comic music you could put heavy metal under it just by clicking buttons and the, the exactly the same scene felt yeah. so different that's why I cannot put music on this podcast at the start of the podcast. I have a little oh, little rhythm thingy, mm -hmm. but I was I wanted to kind of have maybe some music or something when we, when we're doing the intro, but it changes the whole tone. And like this is, yeah, this is really serious, or this is really like uh, this is terrible, <laughs> or this is like what you like right to Benny Hill, yeah, <laughs> or well, something. I use, music, I use music a lot in my facilitation, and uh, people love it, especially online one of the sort of what did you like type things always the music is the first one that gets mentioned because you can just do that with it you know i mean if i'm asking people to this is stuff i have the rights for by the way so it's okay but if i have people thinking um is it a thinking like this so guys there's a button here is it thinking like this or is it thinking like this or thinking like this <laughs> yeah, and you get a totally different mood in in the workshop by the by the, the thing that you choose to play. You know exactly. Yes, so that's a very useful device to use. Use it in the in physical situations, but especially especially online. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, I, I we do, we do also need to because uh, uh, you know there's so much to talk about. But I I really do want to kind of talk about the uh, global surface jam because that's one of yeah. those things that people know you of and and uh, um, and you've been. Um, uh, that was a huge thing when I started out, uh, you know, the first few years in, in mm. service design. And uh, it also was part of, I, I at least to me, it was part of this sort of this, this movement that was starting and it was so exciting and there was all these new people and it was a relatively small group of people, obviously, mm. but it was a global family mm. and it felt like, like this family um uh and i you know i, I speak about it in past tense i don't know that that's not true but it's for it's for me at mm, least sure. that i was like huh i i kind of i i really miss that by the way mm. that that mm. that that global family feeling um but that was a huge thing and um it really you know if you talk about by the way if you talk about living labs and working um mm -hmm. uh, bringing people together and 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 but it's also so it was so much work for you guys, yeah. And uh, and because that's that was part of the the, the movement with that I, there's a little bit of the part that I've been missing a little bit is this. It's nonprofit. We people were mm. like, why are they doing? They're, it's not making the money. It makes no <laughs> sense. Yeah. Because nobody realized that actually it really. Oh, of course, it, it it you know it 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 made your you know you made a name out of you know you know you create a created your kind of uh, your positioning and it was amazing not that that was maybe the, that wasn't even the purpose but no. just this idea of doing something without any direct financial goals mm. or which was at that time very to me new which mm. i really loved about that whole maybe maybe yeah. good for people who don't know what global service uh, jam is you can everyone will know this right? <laughs> of course, the everybody only, the everybody certainly knows this <laughs> so since tell uh, 20... morgan tell more explain it to morgan so yeah since, i'm the idiot here yes since please, 2011 uh, uh <laughs> on its, its basic form once a year but there are other similar events that happen uh, other times uh once a year um we set a date and people sign up for that date to host a jam in their local city or online. Um, they organize that however they want to. The, all that they get given from us is the time frame. It has to fit within these 48 hours. It can be shorter but not longer than that. And they get a surprise theme. And then in these locations all around the world, they spend 48 hours 
on their local weekend jamming around this. So they're trying to look for problems suggested by the theme. They're trying to go out and talk to people, doing guerrilla research on the streets and so on to see if those problems are real. They start ideating and building prototypes and they test them on the street again. So it's really very practical, a design doing kind of weekend. Um, and they're doing it simultaneously all around the world. At the end of the the weekend they have to upload documentation of their prototypes. So it's a prototype focused thing. It's not a concept. It needs to be a prototype. You've got to build something. Yeah. And they're doing it simultaneously on the same theme all over the world. So the one that was uh, due to happen in March of 2020, 150 cities taking part in this. So it's thousands of people. In 2019, it was 130 cities. We got hit hard by COVID. Um, and this was a thing which took a lot of some money from us and a lot of work. We had some amazing volunteers uh, helping us out with this. And we even burnt some of those I still feel bad about. But um, uh, this was a, an amazing sort of movement, if you like. And I've met so many designers who said, I'm a designer because of the Global Service Jam. It was those, yeah. that safe space we talk about. Yes. You can come and try us for a couple of days and using energy and fun to lift that. Because while these people are... Um, are doing this they're into, they're connected so they might be doing a video challenge for the guys in san francisco or a dance off with the guys in sydney or whatever it is yeah all around the world a really really fun thing since covid we so we were, we were planning a big reboot of this in 2020 <laughs> which then didn't happen because literally we got locked down five days before the jam I had to tell people nope no more physical jams online only lots of folks said you can't do this stuff online we learned you can but it's different um yeah. and since then we've been trying to pick it up again but obviously in our business, COVID also was a very important time. So we've not had the energy to put into it before. Yeah. So I think it's kind of ticking over now. Um, we had 30 odd, 35, I think, uh, last year. It's coming again quite soon in about a month from now um, to the, at the end of February, beginning of March, uh, globaljams.org. It's easy to sign up and organize it in a few days if you want to. And it's an amazing, amazing thing. It is. One of the most, yeah. one of the, there are two quotes that stand out for me from my jam time. One which I heard so many times was, I did five weeks work in a weekend and I enjoyed it. Yeah, yeah. And I think the tension between those two things is really, really interesting. And the other one, which I think is really, really cool, is a French jammer said to me, so there was, there was service design, there was design thinking, whatever you call it, in France before the jam. But after the jam, there was a design community exactly. in France. Yeah. And I think that's yeah. really, really cool. Yeah. That, that, that's what it's for. Yeah, it's been extremely impactful, uh, probably even more than than do you, do you, you re realize because uh, so many people, you know, took part in this. Uh, and I so much believe in this sort of this, uh, you know, community, learning community kind of idea because you don't, because, you know, uh, because you don't feel al alone. Sorry, you can't see the, this is a podcast. People can't see it now. I got balloons and I don't know why in my okay. screen. Um, uh, but, uh, but, uh, yeah, but, but it's the, the, um, uh, you know, that social evidence, yeah. that, you know, that, that you feel that, uh, oh, there are other people mm -hmm. and it's, it, it's a global thing and there's all these crazy, so you want to be part of that. You want to be belong to that. So I think, uh, you know, um, yeah, I, I think it had so much impact on the whole movement. So like I said, I, I, you know, we're missing that. I think, I think we need these things mm. we really need these things to come back and to because i think uh, the more people i talk to especially people from from the sort of the early community um they feel the same like they're mm. uh you know we miss that that and we, but we still it's not yes we were busy and and stuff happens but still it's we're 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 um we're, we're there you know <laughs> And we want these things to be back. And uh, the jam was one of those things that we're like, that's such a, it, ga it gave everything a flavor, uh, you mm -hmm. know, an added flavor. There, there, you know, there, there, many things happen at the same time, but um, jam was one of those core things that was always there. Yeah, it's still really great. Those, those who take part in it now, it's, it's fewer people at the moment. We're trying to, we will hope it will come back again. And also as kind of a, People like you know, old, oldsters like you who come back and challenge themselves. You know, they say, Okay, this is I'm thinking this is a beginner's thing, but it's also a space where someone who's very experienced can say, Can I do this faster or better or different? You know, that kind of safe space idea. Uh, so I, I still encourage people to give it a try. It's it's a really, really yeah. fun thing to do. Um, and uh, someone said, uh, a very smart Indian jammer said, uh, Jams can make innovation, but what they really make is they make innovators. 
It's an amazing crash course in the thing that we do, which gets you the feel of it, not just the, you know, you can read all the articles and watch all the videos and that's great, but you don't feel what it's like to innovate or to, or to design until you've actually put something together with a group of people who don't all agree with you uh, and been through that experience. <laughs> Yeah. Maybe we should do like a special episode where we go do the jam. Yeah, it would be fun. It'd be fun. Oh, yeah. Fun to, to track some of those. What's really fun is that the, the early people, and by the way, Arnie, you were very generous when we were setting this up. So thank you for your support in the, in those uh, early years, especially. Um, some of the people who were the, you know, the makers and shakers in the early days of the jam, they're now makers and shakers of design. I mean, they are in huge roles. They're, they're, they are leading government design departments. Exactly. They are leading large organizations um, in this field. So it's really interesting to see also some of those connections have continued over this time as well. People who were doing a dance off between two countries, you know, they're now working together in multi-million dollar projects. Great. What a fantastic foundation for a relationship. Exactly. Yeah. But that's how, again, so back to, uh, you know, how things actually work. Uh, yeah. It's that it's these informal connections and these kind of the, the communities and the people that you meet. And, uh, you know, we are, you know, we're people working together mm-hmm. uh, um, and uh, and you work with the people that, that you trust and you like. And so these kind of communities and connections and gives you this feeling of trust. And, uh, and I think that's such a powerful thing to, you know, I think that's where we should be heading anyway mm. towards. So um, uh, I think, the, you know, and again, being sort of the facilitator of of kind of these kind of uh, jams or these kind mm. of communities and these kind of, I think being that kind of, and so you're teaching people also through the jams as well, that it can be really powerful. So they can bring that into their organization. Um, and, uh, and I think, uh, I don't know, but I hope that we're going to see more of that also within organizations. So having, I think we do, you know, that's where uh, it started. Actually, we were doing it in organizations first, then we started as like a global one. And it's, again, it's a great, you know, come and try this for a day, come and try it for two days and see what's useful. Just what you talked about with your asking people to suspend their, their, their criticism for a while and just give it a go. Yeah. Yeah. So um, <laughs> I, 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 we're getting to the end uh, um, uh, of the podcast, but uh, so why did you move to Germany? <laughs> um, so this was early 90s um, where Britain was a very inward looking place. Um, oh, really? Yeah. Uh, very, uh, the, <laughs> the, the, the Thatcher years were by uh, Major was Prime Minister, who I think is a very decent person, um, but the, com- the country was very... Mm-hmm. Uh, looking on itself and didn't seem interested in the rest of the world. And I had this fabulous job that I was unhappy in. So I thought, okay, you need to change more than just your job um, because that's a great job and you don't like it. Maybe it's you. And, uh, <laughs> and I had a girlfriend in Germany and a wonderful uh, family who offered me sort of, sort of a safety net. Uh, we didn't last long. We're still friends. Um, but uh, I just, I moved over and I, I discovered a country I'd barely been to Germany before. Um, just well, visiting her a few times, obviously, but hardly at all. And I found this is why I say I'm an emotional German. Uh, I found a company that which a country, sorry, which largely respects things like education and uh, yeah. and fact and so on uh, in a way which Britain at the time really didn't. There was a kind of a hooligan mentality. Oh, I know nothing, and that's enough. Which I've always found the least attractive thing about my home country, Britain. Um, so I still have family in the UK and uh, I still love that landscape and that history and I miss my fish and chips, but mm. uh, home is definitely the continent of Europe now. Yeah. Well, you can't go back anymore anyway. Well, no, it's Brexit. It. So. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Door closed. It is more, I do have, uh, I, I do have the two passports, but uh, ah, I got lucky okay. with that one. Yeah. But if I had to give up one of them, it would certainly be the, the British one I'd give up. Uh, mm. All right. Yeah. Okay, Morgan. Any last uh, questions? Uh, because I, I I have a few, but uh, I don't. Uh, no, I don't have any time. questions. I want to keep talking, but I also know that we have borders, white lines on the ground of this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It usually takes uh, way too long. Uh, um, take but a, um, take yeah, I, I so yeah, Adam. So it's it's always good to to uh, to talk to you. I I think. Um, so I'm really interested in, in in that the you know the sort of the the overlap between theater play 
uh, and and the business world basically, mm-hmm. um, because I think you know there's such a there are blurred lines there, and I so interesting, um, and I think for you know um, I think everyone at school, uh, um, you know, actually, and also no, after school should be in theater because mm-hmm. I think that's there's mm-hmm. one one way to really learn about yourself and about others and i remember you talk uh, one day you, you you told me about one of the exercises that you had to kind of um you have to you kind of act out and you know like you, you act as if you're another person so there you're with a bunch of people in the room and you're going to be the you copy you, their body language you copy yeah, the body it's quite language simple. you copy the way they're sitting and the way they're holding their body and the way they walk around it's incredibly insightful exactly because it because it because it again it's about seeing things differently um observing things observing habits but through that sort of it's not a muscle but it kind of it's just let's say that the training that muscle mm. by seeing things uh because you know what you said earlier about you can stop you know and say hey this is what i see no judgment this is mm. what i see mm-hmm. um that ability, it, it, you know, it, once you get that, you know, it it opens up so many things because it's like all of a sudden you start realizing how things are connected, and and why certain things are happening because you're you haven't because you just go with the whatever the flow or, or you're everybody's busy and we're not looking and we're heads down and 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 just this idea of um, naming <laughs> even if it's just for yourself in your head you're like hey. This happened, that happened, that happened. Mm. Um, and it sounds so simple, but it isn't. It's difficult no. because people don't do that. And people always jump a, to an interpretation. Yeah. yeah. So we might do a thing like throw a ball, sorry, throw an invisible ball around, the thing that Anna mentioned, yeah. And I ask people, uh, what did you see and hear? And they say, I saw collaboration. I say, no, you didn't. What did you see and hear? Um, I saw happiness. No, you didn't. What did you see in here? Oh, I saw people raising their chins. I saw their eyes opening wider. Exactly. I heard people's names being called. I heard laughter. Yeah, that stuff that you saw and you heard. Yeah. And it's really interesting because as a facilitator, that is where we have our fulcrum. So if I see that people who are engaged and so on are standing and moving around, if my people are here are not engaged, well, maybe standing and moving around is a good thing to do. You know, just to recreate that physicality often will take you a long way towards these things. Not always, of course, but to, to understand that our people say, how do I make people engaged? You say, well, how are people when they are engaged? They do this, they do that, they do that. Well, do those things and then see if that makes them engaged. Stop thinking in the abst- abstraction and think in the practicality. What yeah. researchers call first level and second level uh, concepts yeah, that you have. The second level concept is they're in a hurry. The first level concept is they're moving fast. Yeah, so it's, it's one is the the objective truth, and one is the subjective interpretation. And as facilitators, we're trying to influence things like engagement or efficiency or, or, or whatever, yeah, collaboration. But those are those are abstract concepts. The way that you can actually touch those is by influencing the physicality the, the 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 words that are said or not said the the, the number mm-hmm. of number of pens you hand out that's those those are your levers that we use and yeah. it's important to understand the distinction between what i can actually touch and influence and what i can't touch and yeah. influence and you but you can move in between because you can say um for instance i, I one thing i i i learned um uh, when i started facilitating is that if i felt something mm-hmm. like like low energy in the room or something mm. first of all i could i could kind of see things happen mm. very practical but also i felt something my the first thing and when i started out i thought it's my fault you mm. know mm. i'm doing something wrong uh, but i also learned that um when i would say that i would say hey i feel there's low energy in the room um what's going on or do you feel the same is that you know are you seeing feeling that too people go oh yeah mm. oh i thought it was just me <laughs> or yeah because this or that or and sort of um just saying just saying whatever you 
think and would feel, don't keep it to yourself. You know, I would always, if I'm nervous, I would say I'm nervous, you know, or if I, if I'm confused, I'm confused. And I'm, I'm, and, and I'll just say it, I'll say it. And then often people go, oh yeah, or if I don't, if I don't understand something, you know, people are using a word, I don't want to be smart. And that's, I just want to go, I, I'll go like, I don't know what you mean. So yeah. what does that word mean? And then often they're like, oh, I, um, yeah, you actually, <laughs> I think it means this, <laughs> John, no. Oh really? You know, so so you have these um, uh, this ability of being sort of uh, you know these antennas. I don't know. If th there's this thing that that you you you've mean it's inside of you. You're thinking it. You're feeling it, but you're not saying it. And mm -hmm. and so yeah. once you start saying it, every, all the other things are happening. People are like, oh yeah, oh really? Oh yeah, it's true. Me too. Oh, I thought it was me or something. So, but that's that's really you know when I teach facilitators, that's the the hardest thing i mean mm. going through a journey map or you know sure fine mm. but that the ability of i feel something and i'm going to share it with you and i'm observing something and i'm going to say it you know and i'm just going to hey and what i think is is critical about that is that i'm very very adamant about this is that as a facilitator doing the work is not my job and you know, doing the work is the job of the people in the group. And they're to facilitate. I can set up the best possible context for them to do great work, but I'm not doing the work. They have to do the work that because they're the specialists and I'm not. Yeah. You know? And you have to be careful not to take away too much agency from people so they start to think that you are doing the job. So part of this is contracting at the beginning, but it can be very, very simple. I've got a brilliant colleague in 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 Hong Kong, Kate Okrasinski. And she, when she's talking to people and she sees skeptics, skepsis in the room, yeah, what you might say is, I see you're skeptical. And what you've just done is you've just done taken the role on yourself to, to prove something to them. Yeah? She doesn't do that. She says, I see you have your thinking faces on. That's great. And that's left the responsibility with them yeah, to, to, to do that thinking, to, to figure this out for themselves. Yeah? I think that's a brilliant subtle difference to just say what you're observing in the room and then trust people to manage that because they will if you trust people they will usually work it out yeah but but saying that is already a big step for so yes so, absolutely because so most people will not they'll will see it they think, we'll think oh, they shit, get I'm nervous they think yeah. exactly yeah. Mm. but they won't yeah. say it and by saying that or just so sh showing that you've noticed that you're seeing them yeah. You're noticing them. You acknowledge them. It changes everything because yes. all, you know because they might even not even be aware of their face, their expression, sure. Sure. and they're like, "Oh, <laughs> they notice." Hmm. You know, and they start thinking about, "Huh, how do I relate? Why? Why did I?" Because they are communicating something, mm. uh, maybe not on purpose, but mm -hmm. still, they they are. So anyway, that that is such a um uh i think it, it in that's the essence i think of of leadership i think and mm -hmm. facilitative leadership but leadership as well because you're leading and, and that's that is what it is and you're showing people you know um uh, you're, you're that, that you see them mm -hmm. and that they're there uh, and then you're showing them options that they didn't even know they were there and mm -hmm. so this this podcast obviously is, is kind of focusing on focusing or we're, we're, we're thinking about and exploring what creative leadership is and to me creative leadership is you know um again you know um like we had Sarah on the other the other mm -hmm. time she's also one of those people like yourself that you show people options that they didn't even know they were they were options <laughs> you know you're like we can go here you know and you're like huh we can do that. Yeah. And it's the rubber chicken uh, for sure. But it's also, you know, saying things that other people would not say because, you know, and, mm. and, and, and all those things are little um, but very impactful um, um, attitudes and, 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 and behaviors and that you're showing people. And I think that is, that is the, that's a leadership role. So I really believe in that, you know, great leaders are facilitators. Um, and that, I think that yeah. might be the change that we're seeing. I hope, I hope that's the change that we're going to be seeing, uh, also in the future. Uh, but what is your thinking about that? And, and sort of that's, sort of I, think that, I think that's very true. I mean, one, one, there's a subtle difference maybe, um, if, if I am a facilitator who's come into a group from a different part of the company or even external, like I often am. Yeah. Um, 
when I say what I'm seeing, I can be very, very neutral about that and say I'm observing this. Yeah. Uh, because fundamentally, if they decide on that day not to do that work but to have a fight instead, you know, that's their decision. I will try to stop that happening. But if it happens, okay, that's now your problem. If I'm the leader of the group, it's not my problem because the work didn't get done. Yeah. I'm still going to have a, a tough debrief with the person who, who engaged me to get this. But, but if, if I encounter the situation where the group is not interested in doing that thing, that I can report that back to the sponsor and say, that's what I found out. Yeah. But if I am the leader and the facilitator, that gets very difficult. And I think yeah. there is, um, yes. yeah. yeah, there is a, how should I put this? It's very interesting to think about. So, so my one of my great uh, no, I'll start again. One of my great models for facilitation is a uh, Brazilian theatre maker called Augusto Boal, B O A L. Google, very interesting person. Yeah, and uh, they invented some of the methods which I now use in design. And they called the facilitator the Joker, which is interesting because uh, mm-hmm. you can change your rank. You can be. Yeah powerful or very weak whichever one is appropriate you can you're not you're not in you're not a diamond or a club or a heart you're outside the suits yeah this is interesting as well and he also used the term that a facilitator can be a facilitator or a difficultator so facile to make easy difficile to make difficult and that's very interesting because sometimes as a leader you're going to have to play that difficultator part quite a lot you're going to have to say perhaps we're not with these words that's not good enough yeah. And this is a thing which facilitators all do, I hope. Yeah. But when I do it as an external facilitator, then I'm saying the behavior isn't good enough. This is not helping us. Yeah. Or the quality of reaching is not good enough. But I'm not saying that about the output because I don't understand the output very often. They're, they're, they're producing a thing in the workshop. I know we did good work. It's not like they were good conversations. I have to trust them that this thing is good enough to go to the board, for example. If I'm their manager, I might have to say, no, this is not good enough for the board. We have to go again. So that affects the range of options that I have. Mm -hmm. Because I can never say, I don't care. Because I've literally used that phrase in facilitation situations where the group was not collaborating. was to say, if we don't get this done today, I don't care. I get paid. Mm Mm-hmm. If you want to make your private phone calls and do this and do that and have other discussions, that's fine. I'll, I'll get the coffee. We won't get, we won't get any of these things done. You want, you, you wanted to do today on our contract up here. It says you wanted to organize this and to clarify that and to fix the budget for this. I'm not going to get any of those things done today, but that's your choice. I don't care. That's a very, very powerful thing to say because it shows responsibility is in their court that they have to fix this exactly. and get this work done. That's really hard to do if I am the sponsor who needs to have those things done. Yeah. I think this is the the one, by the way the, I think this is the the, the big conversation uh, I I always have when I teach people facilitation within an organization so they become facilitators so basically they are maybe their their managers their team leaders they you know what have you and they need to facilitate their team that's what they want they want yeah. to be facilitators yeah. of their team um this is this is the thing where exactly what you're talking about because they own the content Yes. And they are also sometimes a content expert. So yes. they also you know have content to share. Mm. And can you then still be a facilitator? Uh, that's a question. So I always say make that conscious choice what your position yeah. is. Maybe you need an outside facilitator. Maybe you need someone mm. from another department. Or, you know, someone maybe internal. Switch. Yeah. Switch. Yeah. Because but make that conscious decision because it's going to change everything. Um, because exactly to your point, um, mm. if you are the one that needs to kind of, uh, um, you know, uh, carry that outcome yep. further and, and, you know, et cetera, et cetera, and own that, um, your agenda is different. And, uh, but you can still, but you can still do it, but then also make that really explicit to everyone. Mm. Don't be vague about that. No. <laughs> you know, just say, this is my position. This is what I am. Mm. And this is how I'm going to facilitate. And that um, works at different levels as well, because as a leader, you are dealing maybe with that content the output of the session you're also developing the team as a team you're developing individuals as individuals yeah so you might have different roles different balances of facilitator difficultator exactly. boss friend on all those different on those different tracks at the same time exactly yeah. and and I, I find my, i was gonna say i'm thinking of my role as a teacher or then mm. when i have one-off workshops that i drop into some festival or some mm. you know and i just do a one-off workshop 
And the energy that I experienced there is so different. And I could never understand because teaching is a lot of facilitation. But I think you've just hit the nail on the head because I have a stake in the owner. You know, I, I'm also their leader in that moment, with the students, I'm, you know, and yeah, I think it really clarified, uh, yeah, maybe why I, I handled the different situ- situations also differently. And this is the thing to negotiate with participants, you know, to, to say, this is what I'd like to do. What do you need from me? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Again, explicit. explicit. You know, whatever well, I write it down explicit. on a flip chart, you know, I mean, really, exactly. really there's like a, a, a two flip chart contract that we make at the start of each session and that stays by the coffee machine. And we say, we can change it any time, yeah. but we change it explicitly. Yeah. 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 Making the implicit explicit. Yeah. I think, uh, yeah. So... I, I want, I, I, there's one last thing I want to talk to you about, or just ask you, it's about, you know, the future. Um, you know, where are we going with this? Where is service design? Where is design, whatever, whatever name we give it, where, where is this going? What do you, where do you, what do you see? I mean, the boring answer is AI, but it is making a difference already. I mean, everyone talks about it. We've been, we've been experimenting with stuff around that, what interests me and my colleague Marcus, who co-founded the Jam, it was all his idea back in the day. Um, we're very interested in the impact on teams of, the way I put it, is having non-human team members. Mm. Mm. So what does it do to human collaboration when there are non-human thinkers, if we can use that term, uh, yeah. in the team? And we've been running some experiments around this. I think it's very, very interesting. I know this is the boring answer right now, but it is super interesting to to think about that and how it changes things. Even today with our 2000, just at the beginning of 2024 AIs, yeah, there is already a difference to the way a team works, to to, to the speed, to the thrill, and the, the thrill and the chill I talked about before. Yeah, Because things are happening much faster, the generation of, of content, the generation of um of input is really really quick you know i've got colleagues who are now rather than doing research they are interviewing ais i'm not sure where that's useful and where it's not useful yet but that changes the time that your team has to have conversations in the taxi between different interviews and and sort of Im- have thoughts emerge and to develop and serendipity to happen yeah so it will be interesting to see how that develops and how much I think is going to lead towards a box checking kind of work where mm. things get done faster and we go through the steps very quickly and which leaves less space for some of this human stuff to develop. And maybe that's good enough in many situations. And if it saves money and so on, that, 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 that's a useful thing to do. And I think there will be a tension Mm-hmm. because that's generally not what people who enter this kind of career are interested in. They usually tend to be very interested in in people and in whatever it's actually made of, creativity, and how will they feel about this becoming a more procedural kind of thing, a more, a more checkbox kind of work where machines take over a lot of this lifting. And there's very simple things like... I was going to ask how you also view the facil- or the future of facilitation. I would like to see facilitation being a much more universal skill. No, everybody says their own pet thing should be universal. You know, everybody should be a plumber if you ask a plumber. But um, that would be an interesting world, by the way. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But the I toilets think are perfect, but our taxes are a mess. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I think. There are things that we generally do not learn at school in our in our edu- in our educations and so on, or even in our workplaces, which are incredibly useful around collaboration and handling conflict and things like this. And sure, everybody could be a psychiatrist; that would be amazing, but that's not going to happen. There's a there's a level of knowledge and skill that somebody can have. In a bit, with a bit of facilitation experience or training, which will let them get through life much easier and much better. And this doesn't mean you don't, you don't have to have that label on your chest that says, I am the facilitator. You can be a facilitative colleague. You can be a facilitative family member. Yeah? You can, mm-hmm. rather than seeing yourself as in opposition or in alliance all the time to a certain person or group of people, you can say, let me help 
and stand beside this rather than stepping into everything. Some things I should step into. I should say, this is my thing. I'm going to, I care about this. But if, if I don't, maybe I can stand beside what's going on and help people along. Yeah. I mean, you see this when someone makes space in the conversation for someone who hasn't spoken up yet. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. that, that's facilitation. Mm-hmm. Yeah? Um, somebody who steps aside in a corridor to let somebody through. This is facilitation. And I think mm-hmm. being more aware of this kind of stuff and maybe taking it to levels beyond that, being more active about these things, that would be very, very useful. I think as the machines do more and more things that humans have been doing, we need to get better at being humans. Yep. That, I want to end on that. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. It's not getting any better than that. No, I, I totally agree. Yes. Totally. Thank you. Um, Thank that's you. great. Thank you very much for being uh, on this podcast. Thanks for a great conversation. I hope some of it made sense. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, uh, I'll edit it out. That's it. Sense. Oh, okay. <laughs>